one. Okay. For today's session, we will be covering the topic of health abroad, which I'm sure is on a lot of people's minds right now. After the presentation, we will have a brief Q&A. So if you had any questions regarding health abroad uh, that were not answered during the presentation, feel free to post them in the chat to Kennesaw State, who is the host of this meeting, and we can answer your question during the Q&A. So just a few housekeeping notes before we begin, although we're all probably becoming seasoned pros at these online meetings, please be mindful of any background noise so that there won't be any distractions for other listeners. Also, if you have your camera on, please be watchful of your background. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the chat box so that we'll be able to answer them during the Q&A session. And if you're having any technical difficulties, you can refer to the Zoom support webpage or you can also phone in. The phone number for this Zoom meeting is in the registration link. Now, without further ado, let us begin. So to get a feel of who all is in the room right now, I'm going to launch a poll. And this poll asks, how do you identify? So you have student, faculty, staff, alumni, parent, or other. And I see the answers coming in. Okay, I'll give us a few more seconds. Coming in, they're steady coming in. Okay, give us five more seconds. Three, two, one. Okay, ending the poll. So for the results, we have 84% staff. We have a lot of staff with us today. Thank you for joining us. And we have 11% faculty. We have a couple of students. And we have some others. Very nice. Okay. So everyone, thank you for completing the poll. Now I will introduce myself. So as I mentioned before, my name is Angelica Gilbo, and I am the program coordinator for the Office of International Safety and Security of Kennesaw State University and also today's moderator. I graduated from Georgia State University with a bachelor's in political science, concentration in international affairs, and also a minor in Spanish. Upon graduating, I received the Fulbright Grant and relocated to South Korea, where I lived for two years. I am now proudly with KSU and have been for the past three months, so I'm fairly new, but I'm excited to be working in this field and also eager to have this conversation around awareness of risk when it comes to traveling specifically. So now I will turn it over to Erin, who is our Director of Office of International Safety and Security. Thank you so much, Angelica, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, as Angelica mentioned, I'm Erin Rash, and I have been the Director of the Office of International Safety and Security, or OISS, at Kennesaw State University since October of 2019. My previous experience includes working in international risk management at The Ohio State University and also education abroad here at Kennesaw State University, so I'm glad to be back. Prior to that, I participated in the JET program in Japan for three years, which coincided with the uh, 2011 triple disasters in Fukushima as well as did a brief stint in refugee resettlement, working with intake following the Haiti earthquake of 2010. Oh, sounds like they're having some problems with my audio. I apologize. Is this any better? Okay. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide. Okay. So about the OISS, uh, the Office of International Safety and Security was initially created in 2015. 
it represents a fairly unique office in the Georgia higher education landscape, although similar units are becoming increasingly common nationwide. The mission is to serve as a resource for all university travel and travelers. We provide assessment, training, and also serve as first responders for emergencies impacting KSU travelers abroad. Next slide. So today's conversation is designed to provide both general and practical tips for personal and professional travel, as well as delve into some more theoretical conversation as it relates to health. Particularly the latter portion of the discussion will focus on the impact that COVID-19 has had on international travel and what steps we can take to address changes in the health and security landscape as a direct result of this current pandemic. We again invite participants to enter their questions into the chat box and we will attempt to answer them at the end of the session. And I apologize again for some of the background noise. Um, it could possibly be my laptop fan. Um, so I, I truly apologize for that. I can try increasing my volume, see if that helps any. Okay. So moving to the next. So oh, we have our poll number two. This is our second and last poll. This poll has to do with travel plans. So the answer is, or not the answer, the question is, when are you planning to travel internationally? Do you all have any plans in the next six months, in the next year, in the next two years maybe? Are you unsure at this time, which is understandable? And we also have, I do not plan to travel internationally. Okay, we have the answers coming in. A few more. Five more seconds. Three, two, one. Okay, very good. So our results. Understandably, 52% said unsure at this time. We had about 29% answer in the next year, and 10% in the next six months, and also 10% in the next two years. Okay, and 0% on I do not plan to travel internationally. So if people are still interested in traveling, that's very good. Erin, I'll bring it back to you. So when we're looking at what threatens us abroad, and we talk about risks in general, what we really wanna know is what specifically threatens us. So what can I expect to encounter in my situation and what steps can I take to prevent the threat? We can primarily categorize the threats into three broad categories. And those are criminal threats, which are more of your security threats, your accidents and illnesses, which covers health and safety, and then there's the natural disasters, which really branch into all three areas of health, safety, and security. Next slide. So Kelsey Hoppy has this fantastic TED Talk that I encourage everyone to, to watch if you have the moment. It's called Where is Safe? In it, she really highlights the habit we have of conceptualizing safe as a location on a map. For instance, we may think of you know, Italy and label that as safe, or Iraq as unsafe. But we can't really paint with such broad strokes. If we talk about a sum and not its parts and call, let's say, the United States as safe, this may discount variations between cities like Washington, D.C. and Chicago and perhaps Omaha or Honolulu. So if you really drill down, you can probably think of locations in your own hometown that you would consider less safe than others. It is important to really hone in on not only where you are going, but also what you are doing. When we focus on the who, the what, the when, and the where, then we can really start to paint an accurate picture of what risks we might reasonably expect to encounter. 
And human beings, we're fantastic at navigating risks. We've done it our whole lives. That's why we're still alive, right? This morning, you successfully navigated perhaps down the, down the stairs to get your morning cup of coffee. Maybe you chose to hold on to the railing or you turned off your coffee pot when you were done brewing. We make these decisions unconsciously because these patterns of behavior are ingrained into us. They're part of our environment and our familiarity with these habits make them second nature to us. We don't think about them. But when we get into a new environment, we must learn to recalibrate our internal risk matrix. I often joke that when we go abroad, we lack common sense. That is to say the sense that is shared or common communal understanding of how to react or respond in a variety of situations that may be unique to a location. So how do we navigate health risks abroad? Next slide. The best way to address any known risk is through preparation. So on the slide, you'll see the basic uh, emergency management or crisis management cycle. The four stages are mitigation, preparedness, recovery, and response. About 90% of efforts should traditionally be focused on the first two stages of mitigation and preparedness. With international travel in particular, the biggest phase really is the mitigation phase. So once we've asked ourselves, what are the most likely threats that I will encounter doing ABC and location XYZ? We can then logically move on to the next step, which is exploring how to mitigate. That is minimize or neutralize any foreseeable negative consequences. And yes, I stress the foreseeable on purpose. We will never truly eliminate threats. And as such, one's health or safety can never be 100% guaranteed. But by taking active steps to minimize the risks, just like educating yourself, we can exponentially increase the odds of a safe and successful journey. Next slide. So when it comes to assessing health risks, first and foremost, every traveler really should make their personal decisions that align with his or her own personal risk tolerance. While one person may find backpacking through Europe or conducting research in Belize to be relatively low or moderate risk, another person may be completely uncomfortable undertaking such a journey. So to gain a better understanding of what the actual known risks are, the best thing to do is to gather information from reputable sources. So I've listed a few on the slide here. The first grouping is governmental resources. The CDC and WHO are considered the foremost authorities in health matters. But we can also glean some health information from the Department of State and to a lesser extent, OSAC, which is the Overseas Security Advisory Council. You can actually Google OSAC crime and safety reports to see any trends, as well as visit the travel advisories on travel.state.gov to learn a bit more about what the risk profile will be like, including medical infrastructure in a location. Private vendors. So some employers, including Kennesaw State University, have access to security intelligence through security assistance companies. So please take advantage of these resources for any business travels if your company does offer that. For insurance, if you have international insurance coverage, and I really hope that you do, um, you should be able to reach out to your insurance provider to get more information about their network of providers abroad, uh, the medical resources that will be available to you during your travels, especially if you are going someplace remote or if you need to be able to seek treatment with a specialist, um, I encourage you to reach out to them prior to your departure. You can also ask about the medical infrastructure in a location. Um, you can go ahead and, and find out the locations of services, find out whether the proximate hospitals operate 24-7 ERs, or have ICU or CT or MRI capabilities. If you're an active University System of Georgia employee, since I know we have some staff on the line today, um, you and your dependents actually have coverage through travel assistance with Medicist or AXA. 
So there's an online portal you can log in to find out all of this information, and there's a dedicated line you can call if you have any of these questions. Consider any barriers to service. Maybe there is a language barrier, or maybe ambulatory service may not be very reliable in your location. Facilities may be nearby on a map, or as the crow flies, but think about how long it takes me to get there by transportation, especially for those adventurers or those going to extremely remote locales. Is there an airport or a landing strip nearby in the event of an emergency that necessitates medical evacuation? So these are some important questions to consider, especially for those of you going off the grid. And finally, personal health concerns. Don't forget to factor in your own personal health circumstances. For instance, if you're asthmatic, be sure to research what the air quality is like in your destination. Once we know what the risks are, then we can start to really ask ourselves if we are comfortable with them. Next slide. So I've posted links to resources for health on this slide as well as the next slide. And you will notice that there is a bullet point about understanding CDC and DOS levels. I'll focus on the CDC for the purpose of this presentation. There are three CDC travel notice levels. So the first level, practice usual precautions. This notice encourages travelers to practice general health precautions and be up to date on recommended vaccinations. So it's fairly standard. Level two is practice enhanced precautions. If the CDC level two alert is present, then there are additional considerations that a traveler must take into account. Travelers are encouraged to have a more in-depth conversation about their itinerary during their travel health consultation. Your provider can pull up the CDC website and clinician view and go take a closer look at what those specific risks are based on where you're going and what you're doing and for how long you will be abroad and then they can help determine what the best way to mitigate those risks will be. Finally, level three is avoid all non-essential travel. If a CDC level three warning is active for your destination, there is a significant health risk posed to travelers and no precautions available to mitigate those risks. Typically, we often see these pop up temporarily, um, usually following a natural disaster um, for a very small area. So think of Hurricane Dorian and the Abaco Island. More recently, we've dealt with CDC level three for countries and even entire continents with the COVID-19 pandemic. Travelers are strongly encouraged to avoid or defer any and all non-essential travel when a CDC level three warning is present. Some insurance coverages may use the declaration of a CDC level three as a trigger for evacuation. Traveling to a location after a CDC level three warning has been formally declared may nullify any coverage based on your policy. Next slide. So again, here's some additional resources and I have also listed Kennesaw State's International Safety and Security website where you can find more information on topics presented throughout this five-part series. So health threats abroad. We can primarily group the type of health risks that we can expect into the following five categories which are listed on the slide. And I say expect as of course accidents or natural disasters can come with their own health challenges but these are usually not personal health risks that we can plan for or counter during the pre-departure phase. So we have um, our vaccine preventable diseases, our other diseases, um, sunburn, sunstroke, and dehydration, which that actually also takes into consideration a wider range of altitude or exposure, so hot or cold weather risks, medication and recreational drugs, and then pre-existing conditions. Again, mitigation on the front end is key. All travelers should schedule a travel health consultation with a medical provider no later than four to six weeks prior to travel to allow sufficient time for any vaccinations to take effect, especially if booster rounds are gonna be needed. Usually a medical provider will look 
at what is recommended on the CDC webpage for all and most travelers in a given country. However, be sure to bring a detailed itinerary that includes where, such as the cities or towns you will be visiting, and what activities you'll be engaged in. Again, especially if you are traveling somewhere that's less traditional or more remote, your provider should bring up that CDC page and really walk through what you need based on your current immunization records and your health history. So for instance, travelers going to a Balboa suburb of Panama City could potentially receive a completely different set of recommendations than travelers going to the heart of Panama City, despite the fact that these two locations are only about 10 kilometers apart. So this really highlights the need for specificity during these conversations. When traveling with medications, the best practice is to keep everything in its original container in your carry-on luggage and also to bring a copy of your prescription. You cannot honor a U.S. prescription in a foreign country if you need to replace your medications, but it helps lend credibility if you are questioned during customs and is also helpful to have if you need to schedule an appointment with a doctor in country to obtain a valid replacement prescription. For questions about the availability of your medication in your destination, including its legality, its name, or its available dosage, uh, you can usually reach out to your insurance provider ahead of departure with these questions, and they can source the availability of medications or also doctors or specialists on your behalf. Be sure to also consider any additional or unique personal health concerns related to your medications, such as uh, storage requirements. Okay, next. If you are a traveler who experiences severe or life-threatening allergies, be prepared in advance to know what specific dietary or environmental factors you can expect to encounter in your destination. The WHO and the World Air Quality Index Project have websites which can provide air quality metrics for a variety of cities and countries around the world. Those with food allergies or who follow specific food regimens should research the local cuisine as well as food preparation and ingredients. If you're traveling with a severe nut allergy, you can contact your airline to inquire about the possibility of establishing a nut-free zone around your seat on your flights now, not all airlines are able to accommodate this request. However, it is still beneficial to ask. And all travelers with life-threatening allergies should seriously consider carrying a medical card which states their allergies in the local language, as well as carry and learn how to self-administer an epinephrine auto-injector if necessary. If you are traveling and have any mobility, sensory, or other disability or accommodations needs, please research what the standards in place are in your destination ahead of travel. Similar to cultural laws uh, or cultural norms and laws, uh, both the perceptions of reasonable accommodations and the presence of actual accommodations varies from one country to another. A Mobility International USA is a good starting resource for individuals who have questions about accommodations like bringing service animals abroad. Note the difference between service animals and emotional support animals. So service animals are officially registered as such and are limited to just dogs and miniature horses. And currently many airlines are cracking down on bringing emotional support animals on flights. Travelers of all genders, religions, races and ethnicities can encounter different stereotypes or cultural norms while traveling abroad. It is important to research what the different standards or expectations are for socially acceptable behaviors, as well as what the gender roles are in your destination. Some countries may have laws or other restrictions for individuals identifying with a specific gender. Equaldex is a crowdsourced site which attempts to keep up with some of the laws in each country related to LGBT rights. And also travelers who are transitioning or who have recently transitioned may have additional immigration and health related concerns. If traveling for an extended period of time, contact your insurance provider 
for information related to the continuation of HRT or hormone replacement therapy and its availability or legality in your destination. I won't talk too much more into insurance today other than what I've stated earlier about the ability to utilize your insurance provider to help you with your pre-departure plans. Our next session will go more into more details about the different types of insurance, exclusions, or how to use insurance abroad. Um, but I do want to hammer home that it is highly encouraged to have supplemental international insurance that covers medical and medical evacuation. Um, it, unfortunately, uh, an unexpected medical evacuation can cost a person in the range of around fifty to $120,000, so it is not wise to go abroad without it. So moving on to basic health precautions we can take in country, as we've all learned from COVID-19, hand washing is the first line of defense in safeguarding our health. Proper hand washing means using soap and scrubbing for 20 seconds at a minimum, which is about the time it takes to sing happy birthday two times in full. And if soap and water are not available, a secondary alternative would be to use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer with a high alcohol content so something in the range of 65 to 70% or more. Practice good food and water safety by only drinking potable water and eating properly prepared foods um, or those that you can peel. When venturing outdoors in mosquito prone locations, avoid standing water, wear long sleeves, or use insect repellent to decrease the risk of acquiring vector borne diseases. And while it may be tempting to pet the local cat or dog, it is better to admire them from afar than risk injury or disease transmission. Now, this is not an exhaustive list by any means, and so the CDC destination page for your country of travel will have a much more comprehensive list of recommendations or steps that you can take to prevent getting sick while abroad. So now transitioning on to our discussion about COVID-19 and how it is reshaping how we look at health risks associated with global mobility. We've actually had quite a few pandemics and epidemics in the past two decades, and as you can see listed here on the slide, with SARS, H1N1, MERS, and Ebola, we saw a temporary dip in travel that began to increase prior to the official end of the outbreaks, actually. In fact, travel to the impacted regions quickly regained prior levels and went on to increase in the preceding months or years following these outbreaks. Likely, this is a result of individuals simply deferring their travel plans and outweighing the outbreak. And thankfully, we saw that while we were unable to develop vaccines for MERS and SARS, which are also coronaviruses, or the Ebola virus, they were able to be contained fairly effectively. So while the travel industry took a slight hit in each region impacted, the industry as a whole was quickly able to regain its traction and recoup losses. The combination of fairly localized regional outbreaks plus fairly contained outbreaks meant that we didn't significantly change how we view the risk of epidemics in our day-to-day -day operations or in our travels. Next slide. And then COVID-19 happened. It first landed on our radar back in early to mid-January, but seemed to be limited to Wuhan. Initial reports were that it was tied only to those who had been exposed in a marketplace in that city that it primarily targeted older individuals with underlying health conditions, and that it could not be passed from person to person. Then it spread, and we saw more cities in China, and then South Korea and Italy experience their own outbreaks and sustained community transmission. And we realized that this would be a game changer for not only international travel, but for everyone, right? Many countries began to enact travel restrictions with little to no advanced warning, and some travelers found themselves unfortunately stranded abroad. Airports and other places of business began implementing enhanced health screenings, cities limited public transportation, and imposed curfews. Suddenly masks, hand sanitizer, and toilet paper were worth as much as stock in Lysol or Zoom. Shelter in place, which is a concept I used to have to explain to my travelers, has now 
become universally recognized. As they say, hindsight is 2020. So what can we expect going forward? The Department of State has announced that passport agencies will resume processing applications. And a few countries like Italy have announced they will begin allowing some arrivals from other countries. So we're seeing a lot of easing of restrictions uh, in motion and the globe is slowly moving toward a gradual reopening in a few areas. That said, there are still a world of unknowns. And disclaimer, a lot of this is speculative, but based on assumptions of what measures we can reasonably anticipate seeing, at least in some countries, in the short term, once international travel resumes. Many countries will likely require some form of health certification, be it a negative test result, an antibody test or serological test, or other assertion of health from a licensed medical provider. The idea has actually been floated of implementing a global requirement in a similar vein to the yellow fever card, particularly if vaccination is ever achieved, but there's been no movement on that. But what we can reasonably assume is that likely travelers will need to prove a clean bill of health in some form or fashion, at least in many countries around the world. So before you travel, check the local embassy or U.S. consulate webpage for your destination to see if the country has implemented any new requirements for credentials or certifications that you will need to present upon arrival. And especially if you will be transiting through multi multiple countries, it is highly recommended to research at the requirements at each stop along the way. We will likely see a required site self-isolation period for at least the initial phase of the reopening, where arrivals will be asked to limit themselves to essential errands, such as obtaining groceries. Italy has opted to keep this protection in place as it reopens while waiving the requirement only for business travelers who will be in the country for less than 72 hours. So we may start seeing this different tier approach based on how long people will be in country. Social distancing and limitations on large group events will continue for the foreseeable future until significant progress in containment is made. To the extent possible, airlines are trying to keep middle seats vacant and space passengers accordingly. Masks and PPE will be local law dependent, but more likely than not encouraged or possibly required. It is likely that university travelers will be expected to adhere to similar measures as will be implemented on their home campuses to the extent possible while traveling. Supply chain interruptions will continue particularly in places where there are spikes or sustained outbreaks, and it will be important to monitor the availability of goods, including PPE, in your destination and pack accordingly. And different countries have varying level of data privacy concerns. So while traveling in some countries or regions, such as in East Asia, be prepared that your location and even your health data, such as your temperature, will likely be monitored with or without your consent, as the governments there have enacted fairly rigorous contact tracing programs to contain the spread of the coronavirus within the local community. Ultimately, it is important now more than ever to have a robust contingency plan in place or multiple plans. Before you travel, know how to contact your airlines if you need to change a flight or in case you are pulled for additional health screening at tra during transit. If possible, purchase refundable tickets or ones that have minimal to no associated change fees. Be sure to register for the Department of State Smart Traveler Enrollment Program or STEP. Registration with STEP allows travelers to receive important in-country security or health alerts issued by the local U.S. Embassy or Consulate in your destination. And now this has always been standard advice for all travelers, but now more than ever, it is important to be on top of the latest in changing travel regulations or health conditions while you're abroad. In the event that there is a resurgence of cases in a given location, the health infrastructure may be more taxed than usual. So it could take longer to obtain an appointment for standard health concerns. Try to determine before you go if there are any COVID-19 versus non-COVID-19 designated facilities. That way, if you have concerns and wish to seek treatment for the coronavirus, you will know where to go 
But also, on the flip side, if you want to further minimize exposure and do not have any need for testing, you can avoid those facilities that are reserved for the COVID-19 testing or COVID-19 patients. And lastly, be flexible and communicate. Let people know where you are going and when you are expected to return. Communicate any deviations in the plan. Prepare for the possibility that you could find yourself needing to self-isolate at some point during or after your travels and be able to work with your school or your employer if you need to work remotely for a period of time. So we hope that the information presented today was useful to you. Um, as a brief reminder, this series will continue every other Monday in June and July. So we hope that you will join us for future topics of interest. The next session will focus on insurance, um, will be held on June 15th at 3 p.m. Eastern. We're also working on identifying a couple of guest presenters for some of our latter sessions, so you won't have to listen to just me, especially apologizing for any of the uh, mic issues or, or background noise that you're hearing. Um, but if you happen to have particular expertise or interest um, in, a, in an area and would like to collaborate either on future sessions in the series or something completely new, please don't hesitate to reach out. And with that, I will turn it over to Angelica for your questions. All right, thank you, Erin, for that valuable information. So we are, will now head into the Q&A portion of the meeting. And as I pull up the chat box, Feel free to type in your questions. And we also have some questions that were sent in before the meeting. So we'll go ahead and start with those. And we'll answer the questions as they come in order. So let us get started. So for the chat box, we have, do you have any risk management resources for universities that send students abroad? Yes, so there is the University Risk Management um, and Insurance Association, ERMIA, which is a great resource and most uh, universities should have uh, a couple of individuals designated on campus that they uh, have access to that network. Um, so I would check with your risk management office if you have, one, um, you know, potentially legal or um, insurance, if you have someone who works in that capacity to see what they know and if they can share information. Um, I know they have a pretty active listserv. Um, get involved with OSAC. The um, Overseas Security Advisory Council has the Academic Working Group um, that is a wonderful resource to bounce ideas off of. And they also have councils for different areas of interest. Again, if you ever want to reach out, I'm happy to make myself available uh, as a resource as well as a dedicated international safety and security professional um, who is a part of a network that is for um, dedicated international safety and security individuals in higher education. It's called Pulse. So I would be happy to, to try and reach out and see if I can find out some things with that network. Um, but just benchmark. That's the best thing to do is get in touch with other people in the field, ask questions. Um, we're all trying to, to juggle the same concerns and we all have a wealth of experience between us. Good questions. We have a couple more. So we also have, what do other advisors do to engage students in exploring potential personal concerns well in advance of their departure? So I don't know if I can speak for all advisors. Um, I, I'm sure each has their own different uh, approach. Um, Angelica, with our office, is going to be working with health and safety specific concerns. So if students go to the program coordinators in the education abroad office, usually that's going to be their first resource and, and the person they'll have those conversations with, you know, a much more uh, involved conversation than either Angelica or myself would get involved and we can help the student figure out how to connect with their insurance provider to find out the answers to the questions that they need. So um, I, I guess that's, that's really um, a question I kind of open up to anyone who's in education abroad uh, piece who could speak to what they do when they're advising and what sorts of uh, resources that they engage or conversations that they, they have. Okay, so one other question. 
Is there a resource or a site for medication and legalities? So there's not really a great um, compiled, you know, one-stop shop database. Um, there are several ways to, to go about this. So one first place to look for that information, uh, I would encourage all travelers to look first and foremost, Department of State and find out what's listed in the travel advisory. There may be some key indicators, for instance, Japan. They may say, you know, if you were trying to bring in certain types of medications, uh, those are clearly illegal, or if you're trying to bring in certain amounts of medications, you'll need additional documentation. Um, also, again, sorry to be a broken record, but your insurance really is a great resource. Um, there are some insurance providers, I know GeoBlue does this, uh, they have a dashboard that you can actually look up certain medications, again, it's not all medications, um, and they can tell you what the equivalency is in, in a country. Um, what it's called, um, you know, what the dosage amount it's available in is, um, or whether it's illegal. And if they don't have it listed, or if your insurance provider does not have such an interactive resource or tool for you, you can just email them, you know, use your contacts and say, hey, I have a student who's traveling, or hey, I'm traveling and I have a question about you know, what this equivalent is. Is it available? Is it legal? How much can I bring? Or even I need to make an appointment with um, an allergist to continue shots at a regular basis and they can do all that legwork on the front end for you. So using your insurance is a, a huge resource that unfortunately is underutilized because people don't realize um, how much they can rely on that. Okay, great, thank you. We have a couple more questions. Uh, we have one question. Uh, one person is curious about our most recent info on Italy. I'm assuming <laughs> this question, where we get our info from or our stamps, if you could specify uh, the questioner. Well, I think, um, so basically what we know about Italy is it is easing its um, restrictions and it is starting to allow more um, travelers in. Um, in terms of what the absolute most recent is, I would have to, I, I haven't checked for a couple of days, so I'd have to go look at uh, some of my uh, updates. If you're wanting to know about what the travel restrictions are, then some good resources to look at would be, um, there is the, oh goodness, I'm blocking on it right now. IATA, IATA, the International Aviation Travel Association, I think that's it. IATA regulations, they have a, a website that has a repository of what the latest is in terms of which airlines are flying where. Um, there's also the WHO has a bunch of fantastic um, dashboards that are interactive that pull from various uh, data sources and let you know what the, the latest is on uh, travel restrictions. And of course, the Department of State, if you go to the um, embassy, or the consulate for the location. So for instance, if you went to the Rome embassy, you could find out what the latest travel information um, alert is um, for, for the restrictions and, and what the easing, how it stands. But my understanding is that they're gonna be allowing people in um, middle of this month um, and that they are, as long as you have some sort of a business purpose or um, they have several different criteria that they are allowing people to come in from other countries. Um, it's not completely open yet. Uh, I did hear a, a story about one uh, airline company that jumped the gun and thought that Italy was completely open and had a flight that they, uh, I think it went from, from somewhere in Greece to, to Italy or something like that, or, uh, but some country in Europe to, to Italy and had to be turned back in route when they realized the airport wasn't open. Um, so it's not... 100% open yet, but it is easing its restrictions. And also, we kind of touched on this a little bit during your presentation and just now, but are there any other resources for obtaining reliable health data besides CDC and the WHO? So yes, the, um, again, we talked about um, the, I think it was the the International Association for Medical Assistance for Travelers. Um, I believe that's listed on the resource, so that's one good resource you can um, go to listed on the slides. Um, it has information very similar to um, the information that 
to find. Uh, there's also, if you are able to speak the local language, then definitely check out what the Ministry of Health is saying in that country. They should have pretty up-to-date, accurate information. And if you're curious about the you know, coronavirus statistics, again, we always refer to primarily the CDC and the WHO, but um, you could also look at, just to get a you know, comparison, um, the John Hopkins University ARCGIS dashboard to see what that stands, um, just because it is slightly ahead of WHO reporting. Okay. This question asks, how do I assess standard of care? Well, unfortunately, a lot of us are not very good at being able to vet medical providers on our own. That would require a whole lot of digging and trying to figure out what the potentials are um, of the various medical providers in a location. So this is something that we don't want to really wade too much into on our own. Now we can do a cursory look at a given facility's website and kind of see, okay, what does it have? Does it have English language capabilities? Does it have the um, ICU? Does it have 24-7 ER? So we can sort of get a general overview of what a facility looks like. But your first line of, of you know, information really should be your insurance provider. They are best equipped to do that sourcing and that vetting for you. Um, so if you need to seek treatment while you're on the ground, you know, just go where you need to go, wherever's proximate. And then once you get that treatment that on the back end, that's where if you do need that higher standard of care, the insurance will work very closely with the providers to try and determine, you know, if they need to medevac you, essentially move you to another facility, maybe just a, you know, one down the street or Theoretically, they could evacuate you out of the, the city, out of the, the country to a higher standard of care based on what your need is and what the resources and capabilities and infrastructure are in your location. Very good. Thank you very much. All right, let's look at some more questions that were sent in. Okay, I'm looking. Okay, so we are getting a lot of, okay, very good, very good. So everyone, in order to respect people's time, uh, we have a lot of good questions. And if you still have a question, you can feel free to contact us um, through our email um, or you can call us. Uh, we also have Zoom meetings, so feel free to contact us that way. Again, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. And as Erin said before, our next session will be June 15th, and we'll be discussing how to navigate insurance. As you can probably tell, this session was definitely dealt with insurance, and it's very important, especially for international travelers. So if you're looking for more resources, again, you can find them at our website, and you can email us. And this it concludes our first session, and I hope you all uh, have a good uh, afternoon. So take care.